You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers about hikers for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hi everybody, I love you to have you back with me on the show. This is Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis, and I am Mighty Blue. Now, we've got quite a long show today, so I'm quickly going to tell you what's coming up, and then we'll get straight to it. First up, and today's main guest, is Joseph Barnett. Joseph completed the AT not so long ago, and, well, <laughs> let's see, he kept a voluminous journal and a huge number of photos. He's put it all together, though it needs a bit of tidying up. However, when it's done, he's going to offer you all a free link to read all or part of it. There's tons of detail, and I see that it could be a really good resource for people planning a hike. Joseph will be along soon. Now, as you know, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy has extended its part of the program into the new year, but we're coming to a close soon. Now, those of you who have been with me for a while will recall that in the past I've followed somebody's hike every year. Well, today, you're going to hear from this year's subject. Katie will be long after Joseph. The ATC are still with us, of course, and after a bit of schedule juggling, we have Julie Judkins along to tell us how to be an ally. Julie's after Katie. Finally, of course, Larry Luxembourg's walking the Appalachian Trail. And today, Larry covers the super wonderful subject of those magical times we all love on the trail. Yep, it's trail magic. So let's get on and meet Joseph Barnett, or Subway Gramps. So today we've got a contemporary of mine. Well, he's in his latter 60s, like me. Um, this is Joseph Barnett, who goes by the delicious name of Subway Gramps. Hey, Joseph, how are you? Great. Good, good. Now, as I say, you're in your latter 60s. So why did you wait so long to get on the trail? Well, I had two careers. One was the Navy for 20 years, and then I had 20 years working in Tallahassee as a periodontist. And I always wanted to do the Appalachian Trail. So I retired on a Friday morning, and on Sunday I was driving up to Maine on July <laughs> 3rd. So that I started my hike on July 4th. So you you said you'd wanted to do it. You don't had these were they was it was it all to do with teeth? Was it teeth in the navy as well, or were you actually in the oh, navy yes, on yeah. boats? So all right, forty so years you, of dentistry. All right, so you'd had enough of looking into people's mouths for forty years, and uh, and decided that the thing to do would be to go and live like a hobo in the woods. What was what what gave you that feeling? Why did you feel that was something you really, really wanted to do? Well, I grew up in a family that did a lot of camping. My wife likes to camp. So I always just, I've always felt good in the woods, no matter what kind of way, you know, platinum camping, uh, hobo camping. I just always have liked being in the woods. And I also love learning. And so I've always been trying to learn about the plants. All the things my grandparents used to do, they're interesting to me now. How in, yeah, isn't that funny, eh? <laughs> they weren't it, interesting. Was, yeah, it's much more interesting than it used to be when we were kids, no, no doubt right. about it. So, so you say you finished on the... Um, in late Ju- uh, in late June 2019, and you started the trail on independent no, on uh, Independence Day. I started on Independence Day. I always like 20 years in the Navy, 20 years working Independence Day. I'm kind of so Independence Day 2019. I started. That was it. And I, okay. I was re- reading a lot of the journals online through March, and and uh, kind of following a lot of the 2019 hikers, and I ended up crisscrossing a whole lot of them so i'm sure you did i bet that was terrific as well yeah and but that is really cutting down your preparation time were you preparing as you're heading towards your retirement were you preparing your gear or was your gear already dialed in um from hiking in the woods anyway i had uh mostly kind of old camping gear and i had a friend who took uh, my wife and daughter backpacking in southern georgia for one night so I had a tiny bit of that one night type camping, backpacking. So I didn't buy a lot of new gear. I just tried to use what I already had. It, planning on as I backpacked, replacing things. I hate just throwing things away in the <laughs> landfill. So, so I would use it till it wore out. So I had everything pretty well ready. I had three piles. One pile was 
what I knew I had to have. One pile on my floor was what I think I need, and one pile I didn't think I would need. I didn't weigh it, but I think with food, when I started on Mount Katahdin, and I think our food, my daughter and I, uh, was probably around 35 pounds because we took 10 days of food. We didn't know about the drop. You know. Wow. Wow. 10 days of food. That That is a heck of a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so did you arrange logistics with home or did you kind of then go and wing it along the way? Or had you, had you worked this out? Because I know some people are very detailed in the spreadsheets. I actually saw somebody on Facebook this morning put this very detailed spreadsheet in and you know plans all go out the window straight away, don't they? How was your logistics? So I started on Katahdin with my daughter and I having about 35 pound packs and we weren't taking a lot of supplies. It was just food was what took up the weight. So we hiked through there, through the hundred mile wilderness and just, just amazing. We had a tramley. We met two guys from Germany and oh, really? professor, professor Oaks. So we formed a tramley right away. That was just wonderful people. And, and did you go southbound because of, um, the time of year you went, or was it always a plan you wanted to go from Maine down to Georgia? I didn't want to wait any longer. I'd waited probably 40 years. I just wanted to get on the trail. <laughs> and I like fall. I, I love the woods and I love fall. And I felt like I was fit enough because I bicycled to work all my life. All right. So you fit guy, yeah. So you, you, <laughs> it's always supposed to be laugh. How did you how did you enjoy the Soboa's approach trail, which basically is climbing Katahdin? What was that like for you? I, I'm reading all the reviews, how hard it was. And the bicycling, going up hills, I never had any trouble. I didn't feel it was hard at all. Oh, my gosh. And it, it took us maybe 10 hours. I mean, we weren't fast, but I just remember meeting people and, and climbing. And to me, the Katahdin was no no pain, no work at all. I loved it. I, I personally think going down Katahdin is worse than going up it, to be honest with well, you. That's where my problem, the whole hike, uh, downhills. All right. And and the downhills on your knees particularly? Not, my knees a little bit, but not any worse than anyone else, I think. But my uh, feet, every three or four days, uh, they weren't bothering me too much. But I'd get off and they were so swollen at Shaw's. He looked at them and it, it was almost like he looked at them like, oh, my God. <laughs> so they went from 12s to 14, so... Wow. Are you sure you sure you sure the twirls weren't wrong in the first place? I don't know. My feet weren't hurting as bad as they looked, but my wife is a physician and and she looked at him and said, You need to stay off. So I was about in tears. So I stayed off with her for about three or four days, getting some new shoes, ultras. Right. And then uh it's just the rocks and roots and going down hills my feet couldn't take it. So I, I guess bicycling made my legs strong, but you never pound your feet no. bicycling. I mean, I just walk locally around the, you know, you know, you live in Florida as well. I just look, walk locally around the neighborhood five to seven miles every day. And I feel my feet getting pounded on that. And I can now think back to particularly somewhere like Maine, all the rocks and roots that you start with. That's tough on those feet, isn't it? Oh yeah. That's, that was my main weak link is, so, but I just said, I'm going with the flow. So my wife would be there after three or four days or, and my feet would be all swollen. So I'd say, well, let's just, she loves exploring. And uh, I didn't do any day hikes with her, but we explored all the towns. So it became a platinum blazing basically for <laughs> Maine and New Hampshire. <laughs> nothing wrong with that. I got to say, nothing wrong with it. But you're saying you literally, your feet swelled, swelled up from size 12 to size 14 in the space of the hundred mile wilderness. Yeah. Wow. What, do you, what what are they like now? Before I left, I had this a common condition that feels like you have your socks wadded up in your shoes. It's, I get that. It didn't really hurt, but I had that before I started. And then uh, I still had it a little bit when I got done, but I don't think uh, my feet feel like they recovered really well, but I just, they were just swelling so much. I was worried about stress fractures and all that kind of stuff. Right. So, so you weren't, um, it's funny, I, I took some notes, obviously, when we spoke before, I wasn't quite sure why it took you quite a while to get out of New Hampshire, Maine, because basically, you were just having a good time and hanging out and looking around. I'd hike three or four days with doing what everybody else does and uh, loving it. But then my wife, she would time it. So she would meet me at a trailhead when I'd stay with her three or three or four days we'd just sightsee maine and got to see it all while my feet went back down to normal <laughs> and, and did they literally go back down in size again yeah they well no i still i wear 14 moabs now permanently because they're a little loose but they feel much better well i wasn't having as much pain as just the swelling was so big that we were worried that something permanent could be you know i'm in i can take pain but i can't take permanent damage and there were other injuries i know in those earlier miles i think you you talked to us about um 
hernia and, and, and knee pain. Oh, so yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot that. the hernia. So somewhere maybe about the 12th day, I had a lump coming out of the side of my uh, groin. Yeah. Nice. It wasn't hurting, but I was like, I wonder if I'm squeezing my uh, backpack too tight and I'm squeezing out my intestines. <laughs> <laughs> Charming. <laughs> it wasn't hurting, but, you know, you get online and I yeah. look up uh, – I, I use the Cochrane Medical Library. I use, you know, WebMD and some of those. And uh, it sounded like the odds were pretty low. It would cause you trouble. But if it did, it could kill you. So it was one of those. But uh, so I just was going to live with that for a while. So my feet would swell and I'd have to get off till they came down. Then my uh, hernia was always there, but didn't hurt. And then uh, right when I got through the main in New Hampshire, I felt uh, I, I did it. I did the hardest. Everything else will be easy. And then on Mount Cube, I got a tendonitis really bad that I didn't know if it was shin splints. Wow. So by early September, and my wife was just getting ready to go back, I, I said, okay, between the hernia, the shin splint maybe, and my feet swelling, maybe I should get off for a couple of weeks and get some medical appointments. So then I, I did go home for two weeks. And what did you think then? What What were you thinking? Did you think it was over then? I was worried because uh, if they said it was something permanent and I had to get off, then that was my biggest fear. Yeah. But uh, what happened was they couldn't give me a hernia check for a month, and, I, and was, October is the best month to hike, so I, it, September, October. So sure. I uh, I got x-rays on my feet, and they couldn't find anything really bad. So I, I told my wife, I gave her about a day's notice. I said, okay, I'm, at, I'm going back. So I flew back up. <laughs> Without your hernia being repaired? Yeah, I oh, just said move. that. <laughs> I said, it looks like the odds are, you know, one out of a thousand that I would die. <laughs> <laughs> so I got great. back up the handover and I, I started finishing. And I met Tom. I, I went um, northbound for one day because there's three older guys and all of us had gotten off to get medical checks. Oh, so wow. it's kind of funny. That's part of the joys of being older. You know that, don't you? Yeah, <laughs> we have the time and most of us were lucky we had enough money but we all got off for about two weeks and we all got checkups without telling each other and we all got back on the same time so i had three older guys i was going to try to hook up with one of them right and tom logan he was just amazing uh there's also a, a guy named sven southbound sven he was wonderful but he could never get back fully but tom logan and i were able to get back together and uh we were buddies for a thousand miles. Wow. Which is wonderful. Wow. So how, how was the hernia after the, you, you never home? bothered me. And did you it's not, did you not lose your, your legs at that stage or, or because, you know, I, I went back home myself in 2014 for about seven days. I was just itching to get back out there as well, you know, and I actually yeah. had a return flight book. So I knew I was going to be out a week later, but you can very, very quickly get back into what I guess we call normal life. Can't you? Oh, yeah, but I, uh, my wife walks her 14,000 steps every day, so I kept that, like you're doing, five- to six-mile walk every day. All right, so you kept I tried to get back into biking, but uh, I was, between the hernia, it kind of would get a little irritated biking. Yeah, oh, yes, I bet. But yeah. when I got back on, I was I was fine. Uh, Tom was a lot better than me at pacing ourselves. He kept us, you know, maybe 12, 13-mile days or something. And then uh, he was just very good. I just listened to him. I like having someone around that, Tells me what to do. That <laughs> that's, why, that's why you got a wife. <laughs> yeah. So I've always hooked up with people that help me. <laughs> that's cool. So you found Tom. Uh, did you enjoy the difference of planning the days with somebody as opposed to being entirely responsible for yourself? And I've, I've focused on this a few times recently where, you know, people, somebody hikes with somebody for a period of time. Yeah. He was a flip flopper. So when I got to Jennings Creek uh, near Waynesville, Virginia, right. he had to leave. Right. And I had about 760 miles left. Right. And that was probably a kind of a hard point because uh, I started walking up the hill and looking down at his car and his wife leaving. And I was like, you know, it just said that I have to readapt. And as soon as I saw flowers and plants, I was able to, the nature that my love for nature saved me. Tell us about that because, you know, and, I, and I, well, I can, before we get on to that, I want to get on to that in a minute, actually. But come back to that. You saw um, Tom and his wife leaving the car. Did you feel that your hike then took a turn in some ways? Yeah, a big, big turn. Because I just didn't know for sure what to expect. Oh, yeah, now you um, tell you what to do. <laughs> yeah. So I had to be even more. So I kind of laughed like at the first. Uh, <laughs> He was real big on never running out of water, and we always we never had a drought. But it was pretty funny because uh, I came to a shelter. It said, "Be sure to fill up," and I kind of was proud of myself because I said, "Oh, I got a bottle here already." So I was. Uh, he kind of taught me always to have water, right? And always have a far plan and a medium plan. So I kind of 
I didn't do a lot of planning, but I made sure I had water. Everything else I felt like I could uh, do pretty well with. So you, you feel like that the it was when you by, well, by yourself again then, that you started recognizing more of the plants and stuff like that? Or had you been involved in the plants all the way through? Because I know you're, I know, and we're going to talk about this later, the book you've done, um, it's, it's very detailed when it comes to the flora and fauna and so on. Did you know about that stuff already or did you teach yourself on the trail? No, I, uh, I've i been trying to get people to use native plants in our neighborhood. I, so I've written like 23 uh, yard-friendly home th- articles trying to get people out biking and out and the plants so i was learning the plants but i'm i considered myself a total amateur right. but i i definitely was trying to learn them before i got on the trail and part of my trail was to i took pictures of everything but one time tom saw me taking a picture and he goes i think you have a picture of that and i said well i don't have it at this exact spot <laughs> 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 i took probably fourteen thousand. i don't know i think it's fourteen thousand pictures i took a lot of pictures i don't know how but then I could use those to go to D- Google uh, Lens would help. And I bought about six books. Uh, Leonard Atkins, he has a book on flowers. So I, I was taking pictures all along, but there's, but there's not a – Maine had a lot of flowers. And then with Tom was in the fall, there wasn't as much flowers sure, and things. Sure, sure. And then uh, – so with Tom, it was mostly a, a fun guy's hike, and we just had a blast. When I came back uh, after Tom left, I only hiked 10 more days before it's December 10th. All right, I see. And I was up in the mountains and uh, slipped a couple times. It was all ice covered near Parisburg. So not, my plan was to hike until it was unsafe. So I got off for winter. All right. So what was it What was it like hiking in uh, in December then? I, I, I seem to remember you, you were talking about there being no green tunnel, which is, I'm sure, in December the case. What, what else was, was different? We loved it because we could almost our whole hike, you're on top of a mountain and you could see everywhere. And the weather most of the time was like maybe 35 to 55. Right. So it was, it was basically no bugs. People complain about bugs. I listened to your podcast today and uh, no bugs. Uh, so the, the fall weather was perfect. Nice. Very nice. But then you went home. Um, and what was it like being off the trail? Cause I know you obviously, cause I'm thinking back now cause as you know, I was I was there in 2019, and uh, I don't think we, we – I'm sure we didn't see each other. There might be some days we crisscrossed. It could be. But uh, so I just uh, – during the winter, I, I led a hike in our neighborhood. Once a month, I'd take people out. So I had a couple hikes I led, and I took my grandkids out. So I, I stayed out in the woods a lot for uh, the rest of December and January. So this year – sorry, last year, rather, was obviously COVID year. What was the plan? So I know that plan didn't go quite as planned. <laughs> Yeah, when I got off for the winter, I was planning on coming back and I'm going to be one big party. I said, trail magic parties, because in the Sobo doesn't get much trail magic. Sure. And all the hostels were closing mid October. So that's the biggest disadvantage for Southbound is the support's pretty much like it is now with the virus. Sure. So when I was getting ready to go back in March, everything was changing, you know. But I decided to get back on. Uh, so I got on for two weeks, and as I'm on the bus going to the trail around December, um, March 16th, 17th, oh dear. everything's changing. In fact, the bus driver just before Atlanta said, uh, you better arrange transportation to get back because we're laying off 600 bus drivers. Wow. I mean, it was happening that fast. Wow, that I know. Everything was – it was that weekend, wasn't it? It was the weekend the NBA closed down, I think. We seemed to shut down everything. Probably. It seemed to shut down everything in America. It was amazing. So you – so you're changing your plans all the time, I presume, or are you still determined to stay on at that stage? Yeah, as long as it's legal. I don't break laws. But So I, uh, I I took with me about 10 days of food, and so I just started hiking, and I was my body was stronger than ever, so that winter didn't hurt me at all. I was first day or two, I was wondering, but I was so strong that I, for two weeks, I hiked 200 miles. And, wow. Uh, and my body just felt wow. great. That's going straight away. And I... I would just, it was fun. I'd meet the northbounders that were still on the trail and we had exchanged mostly like, uh, where can you get food? Where can you get food? And so I didn't need that much refill, but if there was something right on the trail, then I would add it to my pack. So I didn't have to go to any grocery stores. I just, you know, there's that, uh, truck stop crossing and I kind of stood outside and said, do you want customers or not? (laughs) So I, I, I called all the uh, businesses along the way ahead of time to see if they wanted us or not. Cause I didn't want to go if they didn't want us. That's cool. 
And you got to Damascus, uh, I think, on April Fool's Day. I got there right 31st, and uh, there was probably – well, when I arrived, I thought it was going to be an empty hostel because we're starting to get nervous about what's this virus. Sure, sure. But then a bunch of northbounders showed up, so I was a little nervous. There's probably 15 people. But I tried to stay kind of away since I was older. I didn't know what sure, my risk was. Sure. But uh, a couple of them were crying a little bit, and uh, one was leaving. And some have the defiant, like you see, like, I don't care about the ATC and all the stuff. I'm going to keep going. Sure. And the others are like, you know. It's sad, but I'm getting off. I just don't want to feel like a criminal. So, you know, because some people are calling you a criminal if you stay on and some people. So it was just very, uh, a lot of emotions at that point. But as soon as the ATC said uh, to get off the first, I, I have a big supporter of them. So I was happy. In fact, my hike those two weeks, I kept singing that song by Merle Haggard. Uh, if I make it to Damascus, everything will be all right. <laughs> so my goal was to get to Damascus. Right. And then uh, I didn't expect it to open up when it did uh, in May. Right. So you, so what'd you do? So you go off to Damascus um, and you, I was just going to, what'd you do? I thought my through hike was over. I thought I'd have to wait two or three years. Like, cause the ATC was just going to say, we'll count you as a through hiker if you wait. But that sounded, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. How do you explain that? Oh yeah. It took you 10 years to do a through hike. So. Yeah. But I, uh, well, around May 22nd or 3rd is when I saw that they opened it up and I calculated like, wow, uh, I usually don't want to do a hundred miles a week, but I was able to do it those two weeks. Wow. So I had to make a decision. So when it opened up, I had 477 miles and I had about five weeks at the most. So I said, I'm going to go for it as long as they're legal. So I uh, caught a train. Uh, this time I caught a, a rental car and I started Damascus, had them, the big link. I didn't want to go into town, but uh, but the broken fiddle picked me up and, and I had them just take me straight to the to the trail. Right. And then, of course, the, they're obviously the, the – the virus was still amongst us. What did you go into town much at all? I took another two weeks that time. So I made it two weeks. And then I, I had, I started getting closer. I'm from that kind of area. So I had a couple friends that wanted to hike with me. So we hiked and they probably had a day's worth of food both times. Sure. And my son actually picked me up in, uh, in Davenport gap. And, uh, you know, I ate a couple of times, but I really made it four and a half weeks with just the food I took, except for, you know, like when I was at Uncle Johnny's, I ordered two pizzas. So I was able to just stay out of town all that time, pretty much. Wow, good for you. So you got to the uh, parking lot just south of Springer, and your wife was there to greet you, wasn't she? Or did she follow follow you part way up? She hiked up, and I hadn't seen her, I guess, in about five weeks. So she hiked up, and we met at Woody Gap. There's a new hostel. They said I was their very first through-hiker to finish. Nice. Since they opened. So um, so I, I tried to just stay at the couple of hostels. I was debating the first three weeks. I didn't want to stay at the hostels, but, but then it looked like they're all hurting for business. Sure, and so it felt sure. safe. So I tried to weigh it all in. Yeah. But mostly my last uh, 700 miles were just me alone going south and meeting. I met almost every northbounder and I'd get their name and I'd try to be the relay, like, because no one's writing in logs hardly. So I'd. I'd say, anybody you want to know where they are? And then I'd try to tell them, like, oh, yeah, so-and-so's up here and so-and-so's here. Because when you're hiking in the same direction, you can't tell where your friends are. That's right. Yeah, you're, you're damn right. And, you, and it used to be by the by the logs. Uh, but I noticed in 2019, it was a whole lot of people using the logs far less than they were in 2014. So you met your wife yep. and you climbed spring. How were you feeling when you were – when you were, were you quite emotional at that stage or was this something you were just glad that was over because of the year you were doing it? I just uh, – I think I'm just a matter of fact type person. So it was a night as emotional meeting my wife because it's her birthday too. And so we were able to go celebrate her birthday after that. And my daughter who did the hundred mile, she was going to show up the next day. Nice. Nice. And uh, so I, I uh, was just glad I did it, but I never, never had that much doubt that I wouldn't do it. I was getting nervous because of the virus, whether I could do it in a year now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But-, but yeah, so we met and, uh, I wish I could remember the hostel. It's in Socha, such as, and it's uh, know, exactly above you... the clouds. Oh, above the clouds. Right, yeah. It's a through hikers to cook there, uh, Nimrod mm-hmm. and Lucky, the owner. And they uh, prepared a champagne meal for us. Nice. They, they were just very good. Nice. So you finished that. So having started on the on Independence Day the year before, you finished at the end of June, didn't you? Yeah, I started uh, July 4th and finished around Ju- June 28th. I was actually... 
hadn't taken any uh, days off. And then uh, my wife, I was three days ahead of schedule. And, and so towards the end, she said, take a day or two off so that kind of time it right. Yes, perfect. So I was basically the strongest I'd ever been. And I, I didn't really need any days off. I just kept going as just a hundred miles a week for the last seven weeks. Very and cool. it was just uh, very cool. Now I want to go back to how we were first introduced via an email where you, <laughs> you quoted me as saying that self-publishing a book is easy. And maybe I did say that to somebody. Oh. Yeah. It's, it's... Oh, yeah. You offered it to somebody <laughs> and I said, Oh, maybe you can help me. <laughs> um, it's definitely doable. Uh, but that aside, tell us about the book you wrote and what you what, what you were talking about doing with it. Because this was interesting because you, you you kindly sent me a, a PDF of it and I've looked through it. It is jam-packed of photographs. I mean, literally yeah. jam-packed with photographs. Um, and I'm sure it will make a great resource for people, you know, <laughs> for not only wanting to learn about how to do the trail, but also to learn about the flora and fauna on the way. Were you interested um, – it, was that the purpose of doing it in the first, writing in the first place? What was the purpose of putting that massive volume together? Two purposes. One, I love learning, and uh, so I wanted to document everything I saw. So every piece of nature I saw, and in fact, trail magic, I started calling it nature magic. So I was just, the more you learn about a plant or an animal, like those red newts people saw, they actually live in the water, and then they live five years out in the woods. And the more you learn uh, some of the, there's a white admiral butterfly that flies to Florida, changes its colors. I mean, the, there's a breed down in Florida that's a different color, huh. but it's the same butterfly. Cool. And uh, I mean, it just uh, the things I learned about nature uh, made me want to stay on the trail. Right. The bird that uh, black pole warbler, it actually flies to South America and flies all the way back 72 straight hours. And so all these plants and animals are basically, to me, they're all miracles. So I just... Uh, documented them all for my own good because I was wanting to learn and then uh my other goal is always just to get people to enjoy nature and then if they enjoy it they'll want to protect it because most of the things we saw on the trail are pretty bad shape right now yes I'm sure so you want to publish this and you're not looking to make much money out of it but you want to publish it as an ebook I presume because I think when we talked about it those photographs are going to make the cost prohibitive right. to actually to publish. So I'm kind of asking people who are out there who might have a good idea how we can somehow produce something which has a lot of pictures, um, give us some insight. I mean, I, I can perhaps work out how to do some of it, but really um, I think it's such a vast topic you've got there and, and it's a, such a wide-ranging thing that it may well be that it's beyond my capabilities. I'm, I'm still intending to look at it if I can. But what do you want? Did you want to get it try try to get it published and give it to people, or or make raise a small charge a small amount and give it to the ATC? Or what was the plan as far as you're concerned? I think if there's anyone that just wants to know what kind of nature and how wonderful it is on the Appalachian sure. Trail, and. Uh, I think that's the people that might like it the best. So I just did all that work for myself. And I, it, like you said, it's so well documented. And plus, while I was on the trail, there was the murder. Two hikers died. I have all that documented. Wow. Uh, so it's a very, almost like a historical document. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and then, uh, you and I are going to talk about it um, off of this i mean we shouldn't be having a live conversation about what we're going to do with this but i think it's something that i want to want to try to help um take it forward but if there's anybody out here who has some real insight what we could do with a very detailed about four or five hundred pages isn't it it's 500 with about five pictures on almost every page at least five pictures on every page (laughs) so it's uh it's 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 uh just a lot of information. And it is. Well, look, I, I'm, I've, I've got it in my mind. It's going around in my mind how we can do something with it, and, and I'm, I'm going to keep in touch with you over that. But I'm going to finish, finish this conversation and try something new. Never done this on the on the podcast okay. before, so I, I may ditch it off this one go because you may hate it, <laughs> so, and so may the listeners. And it was recommended or suggested by a listener who's a buddy of mine called Glenn, and it's going to be a quick-fire bunch of questions that I'm going to ask everybody who's right every week. But it's really about what you prefer, okay? So quick answers, okay? okay? Tent, hammock, or shelter? Tent. Okay. Oh, and shelter. (laughs) Good, yeah, good start. (laughs) Maine or New Hampshire? Maine. It's all about preferences. Maine. Maine. Yeah, me too. 
favorite day? There was one day where uh, I met Tom about the second day with Tom, and we uh, it was a beautiful day. Uh, butterflies were out. We met one of the actors from uh, Wild Hogs. Then we met uh, three three ladies that danced for us and became super trail angels. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> no, come on, put, step back a second. I mean, three ladies would dance for you. Talk, talk me through that. As a 68-year-old as, as myself, that never happened to me, let me tell you. <laughs> they were three ladies that uh, we met by an apple tree and you know, I showed them the apples because oh, all the apples were all ripe. So we're eating apples. We meet this movie star, these three ladies, uh, we just were talking. They said, Oh, do you want to see what we start our, every morning with? And they did a little dance and song, how they start every morning hiking with. <laughs> then we stopped at, uh, I think it's above the clouds lunch. And the lady there was super nice. And we ate about three lunches there. <laughs> and uh, that would have been my favorite just, day as well, by the way. <laughs> it was, one of those days where everything was perfect. Right. Least favorite day. When I, well, the first time I had to get off, we were at Stratton. No, we were at uh, Caratuck. And I got off because of the swollen feet. And there's uh, a couple of hikers were getting ready to get back on the trail. And I'd already been off the trail for like two or three days, letting my feet go down. And uh, my wife had been up all night worried about my feet and, uh, I was like really wanting to go and just, you know how it is when you watch your friends, people you've met yeah, hiking off. Yeah. So that's probably what I, I had to make a decision. I said, you know what? I'm not going to cry about it. I'm going to go have fun. So my wife, uh, she knows we went and looked at these, that old wire bridge. It's like an 1800s bridge. And I got to meet uh, the factories at Andrew Scrotton river. And that's where the clean water act started because it was so polluted uh, musky. So I just got to learn a ton about Maine. And that's your least favorite day? <laughs> yep. My least favorite day doing? was watching those people leave and I couldn't get back on the trail. All right. And best view? I was surprised that I love the top of mountains. I've always told my wife, I don't care about mountains. I don't care about mountains. I love the green tunnel. And I think it was on uh, Bigelow or one of those mountains. Oh, Bigelow's great. It was like the sound of music. And I said, I can't believe it. You know, I was trying to not admit that I loved it, but I loved it. <laughs> and your best hostel the uh, Ang uh angels rest helped me the most they when when i hiked after tom they they picked me up and they're very clean and took care of everything and then uh when i got back on the trail in march they were the ones that picked me up and they uh, put everything in a bag and nice. they just were clean it's it's uh pringles who you might know i think yep. pringles hiked this year and then there's uh broccoli Great hopes. And so I think uh, there's a lot of good. I mean, I really liked them all, but uh, that one helped me the most because Pringle, I needed Pringles help. is a lady, didn't she? Yeah. Yes, she I remember well. That's came right. back. Oh, lovely. Yeah, nice. She uh, got to Maine, northbound, all the way to Maine and broke her foot, I think, in two places. Oh. So she went and finished it this year, though. Oh, cool. That's really good. Favorite meal on the trail? Favorite meal? Oh, you mean uh, while I'm camping? Yeah. I started cold soaking and... I never got tired of my grape nuts, uh, raisins, powdered milk, walnuts. <laughs> nice. All in my meal, and I would shake it. Tom taught me to shake the powdered milk before you put the water in, so I'd get it all mixed up. That I never got tired of the grape nuts what about, and nuts and What raisins. about a meal you will never want to eat again? I, I, was I eat oatmeal every day almost <laughs> in home, but I after a week of cold oatmeal on the trail, I couldn't eat it anymore. I think that will be everybody's answer, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Shoes or boots? I started out actually in vain uh, for the 100 mile wilderness. Everybody was losing toenails, so I actually wore some sandals. All right. My feet weren't hurting, but that might have contributed to my swelling. Yes, I think you might well have done, yeah. <laughs> so the ultras were comfortable but they never really helped pad my feet through the rocks. I never knew once I got through the rocks, you know, into Pennsylvania uh -huh. and through the rocks, I, I, in Duncannon, I started wearing the, the, uh, Murrell Moabs and they have a solid sole and I put two inserts in. I never had a big problem with my feet after uh, that, but I don't know how much was due to the Merrill shoes or how much was due to the, I was out of the rocks. Right. And last two, did you filter all of your water? Yeah, I used, uh, I use the smart water. I mean, the uh, saw your squeeze. Yeah, yeah. And last week. Oh, now there's a question I oh, have. Right. So I read, I read everything. So I arrived there, and then you get to all these springs, and almost everyone said uh, filtering's not guaranteed. And 
the only thing guaranteed was boiling. So I'm like, I'm in the middle of nowhere. Now you tell me. <laughs> and you're cold soaking. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever, and the last one is, did you ever deliberately sleep with your food bag as opposed to hanging or storing it? Yeah. Well, the, most of the time I hung it, but because Tom, probably if he wasn't around, he was very big on it. And I, uh, he was my boss man. So I told him, you know, just did it. But <laughs> when I was alone, there's a couple of times where we were hiking from 20 miles a day, day to day till it got dark and uh, his wife had come. So they dropped me off and uh, it was already dark and it was raining. So I thought the three worst things are rain, freezing and bears. And my wife and uh, another person give me some chocolate. I almost never carried sweets. So I had chocolate in my food bag. It was raining and it's dropping into freezing. And as he's leaving, he texted me about 1030. Uh, oh, there's a bear in the parking lot where we were. So I'm in my tent with my food bag next to my head. There's a bear, and it got cold. I had to shake the ice off in the morning. So that was probably the night that I was worried. And every time I kept hearing something against my tent, so for a couple hours, I'd jump up and get my light. Oh, dear. And it turned out my beard was rubbing against my sleeping bag. That so that was probably my one night that I was worried about the food. But mostly I, I hung it, but I was, I'll have to do something different because I did hang it in the shelters where those mice Ooh, things were. And naughty, naughty. That sounds like isn't a good idea yeah, anymore. You're right. Well, I tell you what, they were good answers and they were pretty fast. I, I don't know how everybody else is going to do, but maybe we'll try that again. But look, I want to appreciate you uh, getting in contact with me. We are going to try to do something about the book. Um, I'll keep list listeners um, up to date with what's going on. And I appreciate you coming and talk to us. Thank you. Sorry about the uh, connection. Not at all. Take it easy, man. <laughs> all right. All right, bye. Bye. God, wasn't he determined? He walked the whole thing with a hernia. <laughs> he certainly had a varied adventure, and I loved his never-say-die attitude. And when you see the book he's put together, if you hiked anywhere near Joseph, you'll be there somewhere. But it's the plants and flowers that really grab my eye. When we can sort out the proper access, I'll let you all know. By the way, I've noticed how we've had a lot of guys on the show recently as the main guests. So, for the next two weeks, we've got two ladies, both of whom were part of my class of 2019. We're going to be talking with Brittany Briley, or Mooney, next week, and Juliana Chauncey, or Chaunce, from Backpacker Radio, the following week. You know me, I do like a bit of balance. Now, for the first few years of following somebody on the AT, this show had a pretty good track record. First up, there was Addie, or Jessa, from 2017. Then Bruce, RTK, Matson went the distance in 2018, while of course Dixie did the CDT in 2018 as well. And of course it was me for 2019. Unfortunately, 2020 turned out not so well for Ryan last year, and of course Kate or Phoenix also suffered a disappointment. Zero blame from me, by the way. They went for it, but circumstances just happened, and as it does so often. And I, I guess, tentatively flirted with the idea of going myself this year and had even asked for a few people to suggest themselves or their friends. So it was somewhat serendipitous a week or so ago when I got a friend request on Facebook from a woman named Katie Westling. As I often do with friend requests, I checked her Facebook profile and can see quite clearly that she was a proper request. She was a hiker and seemed markedly less crazy than several I received, so I accepted the request. Surprisingly, she then waved at me. Now, <laughs> I hate that. I normally just ignore it. So I sent back a very neutral, hey, Katie, and got on with my day. In the past, I've gone down all sorts of rabbit holes that only ever ended badly. But then Katie wrote a really nice message that told me that she had listened to the podcast over the years and our guests had inspired her and that she was starting her own through hike in March. What sealed the deal for me was that this Katie, like last year's Kate, was also calling herself Phoenix. I knew that I'd found the right person. So without further ado, let's meet Katie Wessling or Phoenix Rising. So today we're going to meet Katie Wessling or Phoenix. Hey Katie, how are you? Hi Steve. Well, <laughs> I've just told uh, listeners about how I chose to reach out to you as somebody to follow for 2021. So I wonder if you could introduce yourself briefly, and then we'll get on to talking about your upcoming AT through hike. Sure. I'm Katie Wessling. I just retired last June as a special education teacher, and mm -hmm. I am uh, have relocated to the Richmond, Virginia area where my family is, and looking forward to my adventure on the Appalachian Trail. Now, 
I know that you feel something of an affinity to Emma Gatewood. You sent me a little note about it. Tell us about that. Well, fun fact. I, I was quite surprised. So Emma Gatewood completed her through hike and summited Katahdin on uh, the very day that I turned one year old. <laughs> so, and do you remember? She would, yes, <laughs> I do. Uh, <laughs> yeah. September 25th, 1955. Wow. And um, I found that I found that little fact out, and she was 67 at the time, and it was her first through hike of the Appalachian Trail. Uh -huh. And when I make it to Katahdin this year, then uh, I I would plan to summit the same month as Emma, and I will turn 67 in that month. Wouldn't it be neat to summit on the 25th of September? I, that, I think that, is... that would be awesome. <laughs> I hope I'm finished before this. <laughs> Right, so so tell us about that. When do you actually plan to hit the trail? So I'm I'm planning to set off uh, around March 9th. I kind of put in a baseline of, I guess, a targeted schedule, and then uh, have put in some zero days along the way. So I'm thinking to finish up around the second week of September. Nice. <laughs> so now everybody knows that. I'm a bit of a minimalist when it comes to planning for a hike. Uh, are you su are you sufficiently flexible to adapt when, not if, the plan gets tossed into the waste paper bin on day three? Absolutely. So, uh, as an educator, one thing you know is you you always have a plan, and then you always are ready to uh, <laughs> revise huh. that plan or throw it out the window and punt. <laughs> What is extraordinary to me is the amount of time people spend on their plans, spreadsheets and pickups and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And hardly ever it works. We did actually do, we followed a guy called Bruce Matson a few years ago in returning to Katahdin. Yes. And he, he was pretty much on his plan the whole way through, which was quite remarkable to me. Yeah. So let's start with your trail name. Why are you, are you Phoenix or Phoenix Rising? Phoenix Rising, I expect it will shorten at some point to Phoenix. Yeah, um, and, it, and it has a real resonance for you, doesn't it? Why did you pick it? It does. You know, you know, Steve, by the time you get to our age, <laughs> you have faced a lot of um, – a lot of struggles, I would say. And, oh, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as I've shared with a young friend of mine, uh, I've made some combustible choices in my life. And, Interesting. And the phoenix, to me, is a great metaphor for life. You, you make choices, and sometimes you are just uh, the recipient of other people's choices. And and. That can that can lead on to um, where your life just feels like it is in ashes, and then as you as you settle into that, you you find yourself being reborn and renewed, and that's the metaphor of the phoenix is is renewal, rebirth, and I think we all face that. Do you feel, though, that you're a phoenix rising for the ashes now, or have you risen for the ashes pretty much so far? Or is this, is this trip to bring you out of the ashes? <laughs> no, this trip is not to bring me out of the ashes. I'm uh -huh. out of the ashes. I, I am already phoenix rising. And, <laughs> and I, I feel like that, that really is – I think it's universal. I think how do you live a life and, and not have faced uh, – struggles and unless you've had a really boring life yeah I that's mean, fr right <laughs> frankly you know I would, I would hate to have got to my age and, and never had any struggles at all yeah so exactly. I, I totally relate, relate to that as well yeah yes so I agree what is it about the AT and when did you first learn about the AT wow okay so I first learned about the Appalachian Trail in college back in about 74 1974 wow. uh, took I your was, time yeah, yeah <laughs> right I thought I would uh, wait a little while <laughs> so um, a, a young man a friend of mine at the time we spoke frequently about his preparations to hike the Appalachian Trail and and he was uh, we were both in Northwest Florida, and he was—he uh, would load up his pack 
with weights and uh, run up the dunes of Flor- uh, North Florida and, sure. uh, in conditioning. Now, I, I can't remember his name, and I don't know if he ever finished uh, uh, the trail, but that really set me on my path of this uh, love and, and obsession of the Appalachian Trail. Do you know what? I hope it's not disappointing for you because, it, and I'm, I'm joking, I'm not joking here, because the trail hits us all in different ways. And really, you know, having waited for this for 46 years, this is hard work. <laughs> it ain't easy, let me tell you. Uh, and I'm sure you know that as well. So are you yes. prepared for those long slog days, which when, when nothing goes right and you get wet from head to foot, how, how are you feeling about the prospects of that? Well, I, the way I look at it is that, first of all, I feel like I've done my homework. I, I have uh, conditioned myself. I, I've kept myself conditioned over a lifetime, right. but I also feel like I have purposefully conditioned for this hike. Um, it, it, first, I'll focus on the physical aspect. So sure. um, I feel like I, I have conditioned myself for this hike. Uh, preparing myself for it. I've hiked regularly in the last six to seven months, uh-huh. regardless of the weather, <laughs> <Just> make, <laughs> making sure I'm getting out there. Yeah, nice. um, but also I have a, a mindfulness practice that I use to help keep myself grounded. And I'm aware that that there are times that are going to be challenging. And I think the important thing is to not... <sighs> Not, I want to use a, a phrase that might not be familiar, but not, that doesn't build on the anxiety or the fear of what may be. Right. That takes the moment as it comes and just recognize that moment. If it is a painful, if it's a challenging, difficult moment, be just be aware <laughs> of it. Just, just just recognize it and acknowledge it and 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 move on do you know is this does this fit in with your meditation as well i know because in your notes you sent me you talked to me about meditation is that part of it yes yes i'll tell you what a whole lot of hikers would join a group session so when you are around people uh, make sure you tell them you do this or let them know uh, you do this and they'd probably join in with you yeah yes um yeah that would be wonderful um but for me, it's just a practice that helps to keep me grounded and to help me recognize what is going well, what is um, what's working, what's working for me, mm. and and so this so this and this comes back to that flexibility. You know, things come come at you, and those plans that you made in the first place quite apart from the physical location of where you are, but the way you approach the hike itself, that will change as well. So, you know, I think if you're getting planning to meet all those things with a mindfulness uh, practice, then I, I'm sure that's going to help you. Um, the physicality itself, I'm, as I tell everybody on the show, this um, this comes to you anyway. But you're saying you've pretty much got a lot of the physicality anyway, have you? Well, we'll find out. Certainly in the whites, <laughs> but yeah. but I I feel like I it was my goal to reach a baseline to complete you know to begin the sure. hike. So sure. so I, I feel comfortable that I've hit the baseline uh, of of my physical strength, and so from there I feel that I it will build that that strength will build as I hike. I, I, if it doesn't, you're in all sorts of trouble, by the way, but, that, 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 but it right. will. You've, you listen to the show, so you've obviously heard people you know, say that they all, they all get the physicality anyway, don't they? Right. And, and with COVID this year, did you uh, – what's your strategy to stay safe? Because oh. you know, this, is, this isn't over yet, the COVID thing. So have you, have you had the vaccination yet? That's a great question. So I'm in the state of Virginia, and I am – trying as hard as I can to get the vaccination. I've, you know, I'm, I'm on the books to get it. I I haven't gotten it yet, but my strategy, uh, first of all, I'm, I, I think I will be able to get the 
first vaccination before I leave. Right. And then uh, – Then the more less interesting, you've got to get the second one. Oh, right, wow. right. So then I would be able to get the second one, you know, as I get closer to Virginia. However, I – my plan is to treat this just like I've done – for the last year that COVID's been here. And that is to uh, wear a mask when I'm in a group, mm -hmm. practice social distancing, sure. and do my best to protect those around me and myself. Will you stay in a tent or a hammock or you go into shelter? I have a tent. Right. And you'll and stay in that. You won't go into shelter then, I, I, I presume. It is not my plan to sh to be in a shelter. <laughs> it's bloody tempting when it's pouring down with rain outside. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you. Now, there's one more thing I want you to talk to us about, just for this, this session anyway. Talk to us about resources for resilience. Uh, and I know that's something that's important to you. And I just wanted the listeners to hear this as well. Yes. Um, so... Resources for Resilience is a nonprofit based in North Carolina, and I'm afraid I won't get it right. I don't have notes in front of me. Um, I can just tell you from my personal experience, it was a, uh, a resource that I tapped uh, in teaching special education in the state of North Carolina for five years. They offer strategies, and uh, it's trauma-informed strategies for wow. individuals, uh, communities, groups uh, to help deal with uh, stress, trauma, uh, any uh, working with uh, students and adults, children and adults who have uh, faced adverse uh, childhood experiences and to uh, to develop the strategies to cope with the stresses, the stressors of life. And that's, that's meant something to you and your students, but you said yourself as well. So I think that's, uh, that's correct. That, that sounds yes. like a, a pretty worthy cause. I, I'm going to put a link in the show notes so people can s see more about that. And, and I'm going to end it here because, you know, I, there's, I want to learn more about your preparations for the hike next time, but I'm going to tell you right now, what I'm going to st the first question next week is going to be okay. Okay, something you wrote, which I thought was pretty interesting. You said, "I've learned how to take care of my suffering and anger, not always very gracefully." I'm the first to admit. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you about that next week. All right. S sounds great, Steve. <laughs> okay, good talk to you. Speak to you right. soon. Okay. Bye bye. bye. <laughs> so we're off and running for another year. Let's hope that we're able to follow Katie all the way to Katahdin. Next week, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking gear after I've asked her that question. Now, the ATC. And here's Julie Judkins. Well, today, mainly because I screwed up the um, the invitations today, um, we've got uh, Julie Judkins, who's the Director of Education and Outreach, I believe, Julie. Hi, Julie. How are you? Hi, I'm great. Thank you. Yes, I'm the director uh, of education and outreach. Good. Life well, control and, and you're going to you're going to um, <laughs> you're going to educate me today because I was supposed to be speaking with Sandy Mara about their Jedi. the The idea was build an inclusive outdoors. What is Jedi? Now, I'm still want to sp hopefully going to speak to Sandy about that, but that leads on to your subject. But let's start with what Jedi actually is, and then take on to your subject being how to be a good ally. So let's see what Jedi is first. Sure. So I like to think of myself with a lightsaber in hand all the time, but, of course, all. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we, we've talked a lot about the term, a terminology around why it's important and what language to use. And with learning from others through the Avarna group, really held on to the idea of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, which is the acronym for JEDI. Um, okay. Justice is really helping us get past all of the isms like uh, racism and sexism and equity being about how accessible and how within our programming, it's kind of, it's the how we do it. I like to think about it as a dinner table. Uh, if you invite everyone over for dinner and you have uh, meat and potatoes and wine, everyone gets that. That's an equal portion to everyone. But, sure. you know, you got your vegan and your person that doesn't drink and 
So if you're doing your work ahead of time and understanding what's going to make people feel welcome when they get to your house by understanding who's gluten-free, who drinks, who eats meat and who doesn't, then you're going to have a much healthier, safer, uh, warm environment for everyone. That's equity. Diversity is um, what? So it's the representation um, and understanding that the the broader and wider and more diverse your representation, the stronger and more resilient your your mind works, your body works, your organizations work, your ecosystem work. Yeah, and inclusion is in the process on um, on how to do it as as well. So. Um, that's what I'll be getting into. Okay. Well, look, yeah. you, you referred to some, but so where did this come from? Where did Jedi come from? What, firstly, why was it an idea in the first place and who gave you that idea? Or is this the result of a general over, o- overhaul of what the, the ATC are doing? We definitely have been working on this idea back in our last iteration of our strategic plan around broader relevancy um, and understanding diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the, the justice piece in JEDI really is is a newer focus um, and kind of... <laughs> That's just because you wanted to call it JEDI. Well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I think a lot of it is, is it's, a, it's a broader orientation towards this effort and learning um, for, for us as an organization and, and how we get to justice is through going through... a, a big process of learning and acknowledgement and our recent, you know, um, AT journeys is all about acknowledgements and understanding our history and how the trail was made. Um, and that if we can see that um, process of learning and uncovering, then it, it kind of allows us to have the piece of justice where we're acknowledging and uncovering that deep wound that, that um, many have had Sure, sure. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, understand the, I certainly understand the concept, yeah. So that does lead us on to your subject because, and I kind of threw you in a bit of a deep end there because that's some of what <laughs> I guess I might have been talking to Sally about. But uh, So how does that play into how to be a good ally? What is an ally in the first place? What is an ally, yeah. So being an ally is really um, someone who supports a group other than your own in terms of, multiple identities like race, age, gender. Um, and it's, it's a, a, an, again, an acknowledgement um, the, of oppression and it actively commits yourself to like reducing your complicity and investing and in strengthening the knowledge and awareness around oppression. So it really, um, it, an ally seeks to understand, again, going into sure, that continuous sure. learning, um, and empathy, understanding what it feels like or trying to understand what it feels like to be another person or a group that um, is oppressed or has been oppressed and marginalized for so many years, um, despite knowing you'll never fully understand how it feels, right, as um, committing to valuing and supporting people who are marginalized. And doing so through this kind of lifelong process of learning and building trust and accountability um, for, for those groups of people. Um, and 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 helping lift them um you know this is all terribly um what's the word for it um very laudable the whole the whole idea that a section of our society wants to do this why is that important particularly for the at well particularly for the at um you know going back to that representation i'll just start with the stats of the through hiker statistics that we know on the trail um, from the trek, you know, we've got that 2019 survey, about 95% are, are white and sure. 72% with a bachelor's degree or higher. Um, so that's like a very small margin of the people across the United States and the world, right? So uh, <laughs> we really want the why around why this is important for, we want everyone to have meaningful experiences um, on the trail. And there's a narrative that's done a lot of research with um, a group called Rethink Outside that shows that the, the quality of life and health and social well-being improve as if, you're, if you do spend time outdoors. And in turn, your communities become stronger and more sustainable. Um, you know, we really we, we want the AT to be a public resource to everyone, accessible to everyone and have 
the healing properties that come from a day walk or a you know lifetime journey, a section hike or a year of an epic journey, the the different kinds of benefits that come to you. Um, everyone should have that opportunity. And honestly, everyone should have the opportunity to recreate in a way that feels culturally relevant to them. It doesn't have yeah. to be. Yeah, I un- I understand that. And interestingly, you know, and I'm just think- thinking off the top of my head, as I often do, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> um, do you do you feel a need to introduce or to have introduced this and be working on this? Because I mean, the the benefits are clear. For going into the woods, there's no question about it. And the argument for a lot of people is, well, it's open. It's there for people to come to if they want to come to it. If they choose not to come to it, why are we trying to pull them into it? Is that anything to do with it? Or are you trying to – and, and I apologise for being so tongue-tied here, but I'm just trying to work out what the question really means. You know, you want people to come to this, but I know I've spoken to – I know diversity is not black and white, literally. Um, but a, a black person said to me, you know, we don't go into the woods. Black people don't go into the woods because we were told we don't come out of the woods. Well, that may be, and that's one person's perspective. Sure. And that's Absolutely. completely yeah. valid. And there, yeah. there is certainly a lot of trauma um, in wilderness areas as it relates to African-American history. Sure. Um, and there are black people that, uh, like Audrey Peterman, who is a, a beautiful spokeswoman for the black community and how much they do spend outdoor and outdoor right. Right. recreation. Right. Yeah. So um, you're, you're right. It's not, it's not the binary narrative. So it kind of, it, I, I think your, your question is how intentional are we being about seeing who's missing on the trail and going and doing specific invites Yes, versus, okay. You 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 said it far better than I than I, I could. So so that's fine. Just go with that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's twofold. I think we're we're doing work to understand what partners we haven't been including in the past, um, in terms of management and within our organization, um, and then also in creating first time experiences for folks um, and making sure that those experiences are feel inclusive and, and safe. Sure. Sure, and I understand that, and I, I think that is that per- part of it is very laudable. So, so you're you're doing that sort of thing. So, how does one become an ally then? Yeah. How, how, do, how does one move on to that? I think your biggest job as, in being an ally is really very and keeping it simple. First, is being kind <laughs> um, and having empathy and welcoming everyone to the trail, not being judgmental. Like, yeah, the hike your own hike, right? It's a beautiful saying. Yeah, I, I need to say, by the way, before we go on to that, yeah. I, I've never once, and I wouldn't because I'm an old white dude, I guess, but I never once either saw or heard anything other than positivity and empathy and welcoming from people on the trail. And I admit yeah, and that might have guy, been like, your, yeah, your experience. And I know from yeah. my, I have heard anecdotally other experiences. Right, okay, um, that's fair enough. Yeah. And so going there in terms of empathy and putting yourself in someone else's shoes, potentially like what my fear is on the AT and your fear, your deepest fear might be, might be really different. Right. Mine, mine might be, okay, what's that noise that I hear outside of my tent, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, and that might be really different if, um, if I'm hiking as a woman by myself and there's some kind of creepy guy asking me a lot of inappropriate questions i'd have a different night's sleep i'd have a different night's sleep maybe if i was a veteran um or if i'm gay and queer or i have been called something derogatory by you know by another passing group of hikers so i i think understanding that you can't you can't put yourself like you want to be empathetic but you can't put yourself in someone else's shoes in terms of absolutely that's true that's no, no question yeah yeah. So mm. I think um, I know on my individual journey, a lot of it is understanding my own privilege and and for me being white and able bodied um, and not and understanding, you know, that privilege itself, white privilege isn't doesn't mean that life hasn't been hard for a white person. But it does mean that the skin color isn't one of the things that's made made my life any harder. Yeah. Um so I, I I actually read that on an email of a friend of mine right <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> um, so I you know that privilege allows me to be able to speak up without fear of harassment or at least at least significantly less fear. Mm. 
And so I think um, another way is just really in think deconstructing assumptions. Um, you know, seeing a person as as they are and not who you think they should be necessarily. Sure. Um, sure. If someone chooses not to tell you something, not to pry, I think it's really important for us individually to learn as w- much as we can around language and, you know, using on the trail, using gender neutral greetings is a friendlier, more inclusive way. Like, how do y'all? <laughs> Thank goodness. For, that's one that came from the South. That's really lovely. I love it. How's everyone doing? Morning, folks understanding terms like intersectionality or what cisgender gender means, watching for clues when someone might be subtly asking for help on the trail, like if someone's asking to hike with you um, or asking to get a hitch with you in the town, like maybe maybe find out if that person's feeling safe or um, what the story yeah. is, if they're not. You know, a, a lot of what you said is articulating something that for most of us is understood from what our parents taught us to help mm. us, help other people and be empathetic. Mm-hmm. And I always worry about getting too politically correct. I mean, literally too politically correct, um, because it does feel sometimes that we can go over the top with that. I just wonder what's the what, what's the measurement of a positive outcome as far as you're concerned with this particular campaign. Well, I would say if you're the particular campaign of trying to know how to be an an ally. um, Well, so I think interrupting oppression is in understanding when something isn't politically correct and raising your voice if someone's been inappropriate. And that comment is, you know, maybe to us really not that severe of a comment, um, but that one particular hiker maybe has heard it every day that they've been hiking or, you know, multiple times. And it's just like a little teeny cut, a little microaggression and and you build up enough of those and it's just exhausting and painful. So I think anytime that you can call attention to like, ha ha ha, actually, you know, um, people have the greatest, people who have the greatest gift who can, have a witty way of calling out some kind of microaggression or joke that's not not appropriate and with another joke right Mm -hmm. (laughs) i am not skilled in that but I i do think it's important to just recognize that if you're in a friend group where you have complete trust and you know you can say that politically incorrect thing or slightly inappropriate thing then that's i think one thing and I think if you're making that joke, maybe in a context of a place where you don't know everyone's background and feelings and you don't have that trust, then you have to be a lot more careful. And that's when being an ally is the most important time because it the burden on that marginalized group to constantly have to be reminding folks, well, actually, 100 years of oppression isn't that funny. <laughs> Or whatever the context might be, you know, that's their life day in and day out. Whereas for me, I can just, I can maybe make a comment or two with saving that burden from from someone else. I wonder how people hear this. And, and I, I, I admire it. As I say, I find it laudable. I wonder how people hear this. I'd love to know what people think of this. Um, because... You know, you're right. Uh, I haven't experienced certain things, and it may well be that my my, my view is is different to other people's. Uh, I'm just I'm just hearing. Um, you know what? I'm I'm, I'm going to think about this a little bit more anyway, and uh, yeah. and I, and I'll try to add some um, something to in my commentary after. I'd like to add something to to it because. I just want to get clear in my mind what we've talked about here. I think I understand it. Um, and it isn't that easy to understand in some way. So I'd like to really sort of mull it over a bit before I do the commentary, which will be tomorrow. <laughs> so, but, you know, I, I do appreciate you coming on and talking to it, especially at late notice as well. Yeah, uh, sure. And, uh, and we'll speak again. And if I, and if I want to circle back to you, I'd love to come back and we'll talk about it perhaps uh, in a week or two's time. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thanks so much. I'll speak to you soon. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Now, I, I know that some of you are going to be wondering what that was all about. As I say, I feel a little conflicted about it. 
I don't need anybody to tell me how I should behave, though I'm entirely accepting the fact that I speak from a place of white privilege. But I think that I come back to what I was trying to say with Julie, and that is that my parents taught me not to be too much of a jerk with people. Now, I failed in that badly several times over the years, and I know that I certainly ticked off a few people on each of my hikes. In fact, thinking back now to my 2014 hike, when I was trying to write my books about it, I reached out to the hiking community about people's memories of me. And by and large, people were fairly positive. But I'll never forget a woman called Erin, who wrote that, in short, I had been a jerk one evening. Now, I don't recall this Erin, and I don't recall the incident, but I could certainly see me behaving the way in which she described it. It really stung, but it reinforced my belief that none of us know the impact we have on others. But then, I often worry that when we formalise response to an issue, then we tend to exacerbate it more than resolve it. As I say, I, I think the effort is totally laudable. I just wonder about the method of delivery and what they think success looks like. There is an online webinar about this coming up, and you may want to check in on it to see if it resonates with you. I'm going to have a link in the show notes. Thanks today, as always, to those of you who've donated to the show in the past week. One of our recurring donors, Suzanne Johnson, stuck with us once more, while we have a new monthly donor in Todd Withrow, one of the blokes I met in 2019. Thanks, the two of you. If you'd like to donate and keep these podcasts coming, please go to hikingradionetwork.com and click on one of the donate buttons where you'll then be able to set up a one-off donation or, like Suzanne and Todd, a monthly one. Thanks to all. Finally, at the end of a long show, I think we all deserve a bit of trial magic, don't you? I'll see you next week. Ankle Express Trail Angels and Trial Magic I am not going to advocate the abandoning of the improved modes of travel, but I am going to brag as lustily as I can on behalf of the pedestrian and show how all the shiny angels second and accompany the man who goes afoot while all the dark spirits are ever looking for a chance to ride. John Burroughs I don't know another facet of life where people go out of their way to help other people almost for the sport of it said Dick Podiger, a 2,000 miler and former ATC controller. Dick should know. He hiked Maine's 100 mile wilderness with his wife Laurie, who was finishing the AT. Laurie had stopped candy and fresh fruit to give to the first through hikers they met. You should have seen the look on their faces when she gave it to them, Dick said. AT hospitality is quite a tradition, and generally AT hikers have been well received. Exceptions are rare, but understandable. In some isolated parts of the Appalachians, before television and the interstate highway system, strangers were often viewed with suspicion. More recently, occasional incidents of rowdiness or vandalism near the trail, often instigated by non-hikers, have dampened some people's enthusiasm for the trail and its travellers. Trail magic is the term for the aid that townspeople and other trail angels lavish on backpackers. Of course, it is not magic at all but an expression of the goodness and generosity of so many people. Hikers derive inspiration from these well-wishers, who offer everything from encouragement to meals, rides and lodging. Nearly all hikers, particularly those who take their time and remain open to such offers, have stories of unexpected help, and the trail angels find that hikers, with their simple lifestyles, appreciate the smallest gesture. Dorothy, the Ankle Express, Maldon, is a hiker who was injured in an industrial accident, Although she requires crutches, her pace, energy and good cheer put to shame many younger, healthier people. Every year, she helps hikers with supplies and encouragement. A prolific correspondent, she provides encouragement to many of the other angels. Her exquisite calligraphy and poetry can be found all along the trail. She defined trail magic in an issue of the AT News. Trail magic is just a kind, kind way of helping another have a much better day. It happens when you least expect it, but when you need it so much. It's the magic of the trail with an angel's touch. Little acts of kindness, little deeds of cheer, extended by a stranger, a trail angel so dear. You will know when it happens, you will never forget. All through life you will remember, this I will bet. Trail magic, angels everywhere. What trail magic means, there are those who care. 
Henry Phillips remembers walking along a road near Mount Weather, Virginia. A woman drove by, rolled down her electric window and said, If I were walking along this road, I'd sure like an apple. And she handed me a bunch of chocolate chip cookies and an apple. A couple in Catawba, Virginia, who operated a grain store, offered Jim Pony Adams refuge from a thunderstorm in a new grain shed. I never spent a more pleasant night in my life, he said. Listening to the rain on the metal roof and smelling the grain, he was reminded of his grandfather's farm fifty years before. Judy, the butterfly lady, and Ralph, the hobbit, Goodno, were caught in a blizzard on May the 7th, 1990, on Roan Mountain. Ralph went on to Roan High Knob Shelter, dropped his pack and went back to help Judy. Meanwhile, the snowstorm intensified and Judy wandered off the trail. By the time Ralph helped Judy back to the shelter, she was nearly hypothermic. Ralph made some hot soup and eventually Judy felt better. But she was still upset. I'm never going to meet a trail angel, she said. Early the next morning, the door flung open and in walked Carol Lagunatic Moore with bagels, orange juice, crackers, fruit and other goodies. Judy cried, a trail angel. A handful of people have been helping hikers for 30 or 40 years. Former Governor and Mrs Thompson, proprietors of the Mount Cube Sugar House, have been taken in hikers since the time of Grandma Gatewood. Kay Wood in Dalton, Massachusetts, has taken in hikers just as long. The trail used to go right by a house. She has moved, but now the nearby Kay Wood shelter is a substitute. Among the most revered of trail angels is Sam, habitual maintainer, Waddle. When you say trail angel, Sam Waddle is the first name that springs to many people's minds. Growing up in an East Tennessee valley, Sam could see where the AT crossed Cold Spring Mountain. As a child, he rode a horse onto that mountain. In the mid-70s, he began maintaining a stretch of the AT there that includes Jerry Cabin Shelter. Since then, he's come up from his farm as many as 30 times a year to work on the trail, and he hasn't slowed down, despite being in his 70s. He's worn out two or three chainsaws and made hundreds of friends. He figures he's put in more than 2,800 hours of trail work. It's not been easy, he said, but I'm dedicated and stubborn and refuse to give up. I met a lot of lovely people. I'd help however I could. I like to help everyone. When Dorothy Hansen was through hiking in 1979, she ran into Sam at the shelter. He shared a snack with her and her companions and told them about the trail up ahead. He also sent a letter to her parents to let them know how she was doing. Later, she wrote to Sam, You were one of the best things that happened to me on my entire trip. It's just one among dozens of letters thanking Sam for his kindnesses. In the early 70s, Ed Garvey described Jerry Cabin as the dirtiest shelter on the entire trail. Sam took over several years later and has made it one of the best. He's put in a new roof, wooden bunks and a bogus light switch and telephone and he's boxed in the spring. After this turnabout, Ed has been campaigning to get the shelter renamed the Sam Waddle Shelter. Sam has often handed out food or rescued injured hikers. About every hiker I meet says, You must be Sam, he said. At his home, he has one of the largest collections of AT memorabilia. 22 photo albums and scrapbooks. He has files of letters from around the world and many gifts from hikers. In 1988, Sam scattered the ashes of Howard Bassett, his close friend and a 1968 through hiker, along the trail about a mile from the shelter. North of the North Carolina-Virginia border are two towns, Damascus and Perrysburg, that compete for the title of the friendliest town on the trail. Damascus has a long tradition of helping hikers. When Gene Espy came through in 1951, Police Chief Orville Corney McNish chauffeured him around town, gave him comfortable lodging in the jail and plied him with food. Pascal Grindstaff, Damascus postmaster for 28 years until he retired in 1985, was a legendary trail angel. Even after all these years, the town has not tired of the hikers. With the start of the annual Trail Days Festival in May 1987, the town is an even more notable landmark for thru-hikers. Hikers who are separated on the trail have a chance for a reunion at Trail Days. Charlie Trivet, one of the founders of Trail Days, has taken care of the hikers' hostel in Damascus, known as The Place, since its inception. Charlie, a lifelong resident of the area, says that more than 30,000 hikers have stayed at The Place since it opened in 1976. 
David Lipsky was through hiking in 1975 when the hostel was being redded and he gave it its name. There was an old board out there and he carved out the place and hung it up, Charlie said. The winter before the hostel opened, Charlie read a book about the AT and he and his wife decided to help hikers. He hadn't known much about the AT, but he'd been hiking those mountains all his life, putting in enough miles to do the whole trail several times over. That first year, Charlie brought most of the thru-hikers over to his house for a barbecue. He was largely responsible for adding some attractive AT features to a park at the entrance to town. He's put up a welcoming arch through which hikers pass. Charlie loves meeting new people from all over the world. When you get on the trail, it's just people with people. There's no, I'm better than you. There's no caste system on the trail. It's just people helping people. One of the special people Charlie remembers meeting was Evelyn Candle, a woman in her 60s making her first big hike in 1976. She fell near Roanoke, breaking an arm. A few days later, with her arm in a cast, she returned to the trail. In New England, she fell again, breaking her collarbone. To her, everything was beautiful, Charlie said. Everybody had been talking about a hard climb down in the Stacoas. It was rainy, she'd say, but the rain was so beautiful, I didn't notice the climbing. Not far north of Damascus is Perisburg, where Father Charles converted an old barn into a hostel in 1977. Bill Gordia, a native of Perisburg, has been tending to the hostel since 1984. I enjoy talking to them, he said of hikers. I do everything I can to help them. Of this area in southwestern Virginia, he said, these mountains grow on you. They call it Perisburg. I call it paradise. A short distance south of Perisburg is a unique trail refuge, a cabin called Woods Hole. Because it's a half mile off the trail and so close to Perisburg, many hikers pass by Woods Hole. They shouldn't. Tilly Wood and her late husband Roy purchased the cabin in 1939 when he needed to live in the area to research the local elk herd's feeding habits. Along the trail at Big Horse Gap, there's a grove of white piney planted to keep elk from damaging local crops. The cabin is an oasis of tranquility in a small, steep clearing. A short distance away is a building for hikers with loft sleeping quarters. Behind it is Moonshadow's Monument, an outhouse built by an earlier hiker. Roy and Tilly started taking in hikers in 1986 at the suggestion of longtime friend Dave Sherman, a 2000 miler and AT activist. Since then, Tilly has maintained the hostel herself, with help in recent years from Hugh High Pockets Penn. A naturalist in her own right, Tilly has a master's degree in mycology, mushrooms. Roy had the distinction of being fired from two different government jobs by James Watt, former Secretary of the Interior. President Carter, whom Roy had served in Georgia, appointed Roy an assistant secretary of the interior and he stayed on for part of the Reagan administration. Tilly said that when only a few hikers stop at the hostel, she gets to know them well, but if they are, say, a dozen, they talk among themselves. If they're by themselves, they come sit on the porch or I go out and talk to them. They have a lot in common. They want to talk about their packs and their tents and what they're eating and cooking, and I'm not interested in that. Last night there were three and all three came up on the porch and we sat and talked. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Like everyone else, Tilly is impressed by the way information travels along the trail. The gossip that goes up and down the trail amazes me. Everybody knows where everybody else is and what they're doing. Tilly and Roy were among the early founders of the Nantahala Outdoor Centre in Wesser, North Carolina. After the Wallace Yee Centre in Neal's Gap, this is the first outpost of civilization that northbound hikers find right on the trail. The Georgia Canoe Association, to which Roy and Tilly belonged, used to have their races there. Roy was the announcer and Tilly was the registrar. Two club members bought the motel there in 1972. It has expanded greatly over the years and remains owned by its 350 employees. Many AT hikers stay over before tackling the Stokoa section one of the hardest parts of the trail. Pennsylvania has long had an outstanding group of trail angels. Perhaps foremost was Bonnie, the ice cream lady, Shipe, who would give hikers an ice cream cone, a cold drink and lots of encouragement. A few years ago, the trail across the Cumberland Valley was relocated onto ridges and farm fields and it no longer passes Bonnie's house. In Port Clinton, Pennsylvania, a long-time AT tradition will soon end. Many an AT hiker has taken a meal or stayed overnight at the Port Clinton Hotel. Helen Carabor, who has run the hotel since February 1965, has been trying to sell it, maybe because she's 80 and does most of the work herself. 
Mills were whatever she had on hand, and few people complained. Surrounded by steep climbs and rocky trails, the hotel and the next door peanut store were bright spots along this stretch. Helen has traced the origin of the hotel, once a stagecoach stop, to at least 1847. At one time there were five hotels in town, but Helen's is the only survivor. About hikers, she said, some schnooks, but 98% were terrific people. Sometimes, when there were supposed to be two in a room, she'd find six. Others would drive nails into the walls or do laundry in the bathroom, which was against the rules. She remembers four men passing a little bitty cigarette around at the bar. She thought they didn't have much money and were trying to economise on their cigarettes. When she got a terrible headache, she realised it was marijuana. Some trail angels are hikers from previous years who returned to the trail from Georgia to Maine, offering buffets or barbecues for hungry hikers. Countless others simply pick up a hiker here, offer a cold drink there, or shout encouragement as they pass. For many hikers, these acts of generosity are the best part of their journey. After they complete the AT, they often mail postcards to those who have helped them on the trail. Nevertheless, Arthur, AB positive, Bachelda, worries that hikers aren't sufficiently considerate of the trail angels. They're an endangered species, as much as a wildflower is. We talk about just taking photographs, just leaving footprints. Well, that should be said about all these people who are out there allowing us to have our fun. We should be just as kind and considerate to them as we are to the flowers. How many people could make it from Springer all the way to Katahdin without these people? Very few. Profile Roger Brickner Roger is unique among trail angels in any number of ways. For one thing, he advertises. For another, even among dozens of generous souls, he stands out for his many kindnesses to hikers. He's also one of the few who've hiked the whole trail. He's had two locations, New York and New Hampshire, and in an 80-year community full of people with single-minded intensity, Roger's 50-year study of weather stands out. Finally, he's brave. He gave my three young children chocolate ice cream in the living room of his beautiful old New Hampshire home. In 1979, through hikers got together and gave Roger an ATC life membership. Roger Brickner has been a fixture on the AT for 20 years. For many of those years, his Appalachia cottage at Greenwood Lake, New York, was a refuge that many 2,000 milers looked forward to for much of their journey. Here and there along the trail would be signs advising hikers to be on the lookout for Appalachia Cottage. Frank, the merry Slav, Krakovich, recalls seeing a cardboard sign in Georgia that read, Through hikers, are you cold, wet, hungry? Don't despair. Roger's Appalachia Cottage is only 1,275 miles away. Roger was a long-time resident of Queens, New York. In the early 70s, he sought a refuge in the country. Once Roger moved into Appalachia Cottage, he began wandering around on Belleville Mountain. The AT runs along its crest for many miles. In August 1973, Roger cut a quarter-mile trail from his cottage to the AT. That became one of the toughest blue blaze trails along the entire AT. Soon after he cut the trail, some ill-equipped Boy Scouts, cold and wet, straggled down on a stormy night. Roger gave them lodging. The next summer, during a series of thunderstorms, Roger began to think again about hikers on the ridge. Eventually, he left a handwritten note at the intersection of the 80 and his side trail, saying, Hikers welcome. The very first day, someone showed up. Ever since, hikers have kept coming. Over the years, Roger has sheltered nearly 2,000 hikers, given them meals and often rides to help them resupply or to hike without their packs for a day. He's developed a reputation among hikers as a fast and good cook. Eventually, he started the Oasis, a clearing just off the trail for hikers who didn't want to make the steep descent to his cottage. He put up a small table and chairs, and each day he or some hiker returning to the trail would drop off a cooler of lemonade and a copy of the New York Times. One person that really sticks out in my mind was Roger of Appalachia Cottage, said Jan Skardberg, who hiked in 1980. Go down there, wine, hors d'oeuvres, just eat, drink, be merry. After dinner drinks, movies, slides. I mean, there were six of us that night and he made a seven-course dinner. Such a gentleman and such a giver. I have a lot of interests, Roger said. I can't say I'm obsessed with the AT. I believe that you do what you can when you can and where you are. The more I got to know these people, the more I realised, especially after having done the trail myself, how nice it is to just have a night off and be able to talk. Most of them are talkers, especially those that are early in the season and on their own. Boy, are they.
they talkers? There's something monumental about what people are doing, especially when they hike in one season from one end to another. I guess that's to be respected and appreciated. It makes you a little part of what they're doing. In 1984, Roger retired as a high school history and government teacher. Another reason Roger likes taking hikers is the similarity to teaching. Is the similarity to teaching. You get a group and you talk to them, he said. He does limit the size so that it's possible to have civilised conversations. After retiring, Roger began spending more time at his new home, a historic house built in 1810 in Haverhill, New Hampshire. Now he lives a 15-minute drive from the trail. Because hikers can no longer walk to his home, he has devised a new system. During a six-week season, he has hikers call between three and four in the afternoon and he or his friend picks them up. In the rear of his house is a loft in which hikers can sleep. Beneath it is the Samuel Adams Inn. Along the side of the inn's pub room is a mural map of the AT, painted by many hikers, but principally Mark Carroll, who threw hikes in 1977 and 1986. Now Roger takes in hikers five days a week, leaving Wednesdays and Saturdays open for other friends to visit or for him to hike the trail. Limiting his availability seems to have prevented burnout, which has happened to other trail angels. I get people saying, why are you doing this anymore? Because I still enjoy it. I still enjoy talking to people, and from a sociological point of view, I find it fascinating to see the change in who is on the trail. In earlier years, he notes, there was a greater proportion of young hikers. Now there are more women and older people. Hikers 30 to 50 were almost non-existent in the late 70s and early 80s. There were a lot of late teens and early 20s. He believes the current dearth of younger hikers may be because we have this increasing perceived or misperceived notion that life is so much more dangerous today. I'm not convinced that it is. Hikers who have been out on the trail a while stink, Roger noted. I wouldn't say it bothered me, but I was amazed at what a stench the body could manage, Roger said. And their look didn't bother me because the minute I would talk to them, I saw they were regular human beings. I could imagine what I would look like if I were out there a whole week without showering. When they arrive at his cottage, he usually suggests... Why don't you run and get a shower first? According to Roger, anyone who's not used to it will smell them immediately. Occasionally, if we had visitors, they'd say, Oh God! Behind the house is Roger's Museum of American Weather, again featuring paintings by Mark Carroll. The museum includes historic weather instruments and exhibits on major storms, including the hurricane of 1938, the storm of the century in the northeast. That storm, which devastated parts of coastal New Jersey, Long Island and New England, ignited Roger's lifelong interest in weather. As a nine-year-old, he lived through it, and as an adult, he wrote a book about it, The Long Island Express, Tracking the Hurricane of 1938. It killed hundreds of people, destroyed thousands of buildings in its path, and altered the course of AT history. The final section of the trail was blazed and opened on August 14th, 1937, Thirteen months later, the trail was devastated as thousands of trees were blown down by high winds. A casual hiker for much of his life, in the late 50s Roger went out west five straight summers and day hiked or took overnight trips in the Rockies. He also had done some day hiking in the New York area and New England, totalling about 200 miles of the AT. Tackling the whole AT, however, seemed a forbidding prospect. Even today he cannot conceive of being away from home for five or six months. I didn't do it that way because I couldn't conceive of it. You can't do something you can't conceive of. He added, I find that there's a degree of monotony in just the coverage of mile after mile for the sake of just getting those 2100 miles done. The way I have made it interesting, because of my own way of looking at things, is to do it in two week bits. Listening to the hikers who stayed with him had prompted Roger to consider hiking the AT himself. In the early 80s, he met Anne and Al Weed, one of the most adventuresome retired couples ever to hike the AT. Anne and Al believed that being retired meant you had more time to play. They went on canoe trips, hikes and long rides on their motorcycles. They kept telling Roger he should do the trail. In 1982, the Weeds set up their recreational vehicle in the southern Appalachians and began helping hikers. They offered to help Roger. They put him on the trail each morning and gave him a place to stay at night. Roger kept at the AT, finally finishing in 1987 at Mount Rogers, Virginia. There he was met by his own trail angel, Mike Patch, a 1983 through hiker. Mike, who had become partially paralysed in a 1984 automobile accident, brought champagne to celebrate Roger's achievement. 
Roger admits that he found it a bit anticlimactic not finishing at Katahdin. He added that he would not deny the value of hiking the whole trail in one season. That has got to be an entirely different experience, he said. Of course, north to south isn't as dramatic because you end up on a perch there, a Springer Mountain. One of the benefits that Roger found in walking the trail was the time it gave him to think. What a place for thinking and planning, he said. <laughs>